We're going to Matthew chapter 6 this morning. Matthew chapter 6. We are in a series on the Sermon in the, on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter number 6. As we've been studying this Sermon on the Mount, one glaring truth uh, really comes to the forefront. And then that's the, 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 you know, if we could say the premise of what Jesus is trying to communicate. The premise of what Jesus is trying to communicate is that this series of teachings is how to live in his kingdom without hypocrisy. How to live in his kingdom without hypocrisy. There are some that complain about the Bible, say, well, the Bible is just a great big book of do's and don'ts, and there are do's, and there are don'ts in Scripture. There are instructions given to us in God's Word, but that's exactly the truth of what God's Word is. It's instructions. It's teachings for us how to live a life that's pleasing to God, how to live our life that, that is in our best interests. Uh, really, it's how to live as God intends for us to live. And I want us to see here, as we, we look at Christ's kingdom, Christ's kingdom is not a kingdom on this earth, not at this time. Christ's kingdom on earth is a spiritual kingdom. As he stood before Pilate, and Pilate asked, Are you a king? Jesus said, I am a king, but not of this world. He is our, he's a heavenly king. And the work of his kingdom at this time on this earth is done through the local New Testament church. Because his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, there are certain practices of the kingdom that are spiritual practices. And that's what he teaches on here in this first part of Matthew chapter number 6. Let's read from verse number 1. We'll go on to verse number 18, and we'll come back and, and look at him again. Notice verse 1. Take heed. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise... Ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut thy, hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which, uh, which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much praying. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven." Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast... Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Father, we've prayed multiple times in the service. We've prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. We've challenged our congregation together to pray a prayer of surrender, 
and seeking your hand and seeking your guidance now through this preaching time. Now, Lord, I'm asking for your guidance. I'm asking for your hand of power and blessing on the preaching of your word. This is your, this is your program. You've called the church to preach. You've called the church to worship. You've called the church to disciple. We're doing what you have led us to do. But Lord, we cannot do so in our strength. We've got to have your help. So please, would you make yourself very real this morning? Speak through this flawed vessel to others that we might turn from our stubborn ways and seek your way and seek your, your will for our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would live as Jesus lived, that we would do the things here of, of alms and prayer and fasting the way you did it, Lord. Help us really, help us just to be like you. Very simple, very straightforward. Help us to be like Jesus. I pray if there's anybody here this morning, whether in person or on the live stream that, or, or on YouTube, that later on uh, they, they, they realize they've never even begun a relationship with Christ. They've never been born again. I pray that today would be the day they get it settled. We ask these things in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. As we've said, the, the premise of the Sermon on the Mount is how to live in God's kingdom without hypocrisy. And boy, oh boy, does he drill down on that topic here as he addresses three spiritual activities that, quite frankly, he expects his, his church to be involved in. He expects his believers, his followers, to be involved in. So let's see these three things here. Let's see what Jesus had to say. And then at the end, we're going to find an application I believe will be a help to us. First of all, Jesus begins with the subject of alms. Alms. Now, we don't usually use that word much anymore, alms. Uh, I can think of maybe like, you know, an old-time cartoon. You got some guy who's got a little tin cup and raggedy clothes walking around going, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. An alm is a act of generosity for those who are in need. An act of generosity for those who are in need. Pretty straightforward. We don't often think of that as being a spiritual exercise, a spiritual discipline, but according to Jesus, it is. And according to the, early, the, the, the practice of the early church and even the Jews in Jesus' day, they recognized that to be the case. In Jesus' day and age, it was not uncommon in each city where there was a synagogue or in Jerusalem where there was the temple to have a collection box or a collection pot or, or something where they would collect money or goods each Sabbath, each week, for to be distributed to those who were needy and who, who were poor. Now, much of their worship, as you would have seen in the Old Testament days of David and Solomon, was put on hold during the days of the Roman occupation. They could not worship God as freely as they would have chosen to. And so, in Jesus' day, the Jews held this act of alms as a very high spiritual activity, on the same level as giving sacrifice. It was very important to them. We find in the early church the same emphasis. As you go to Acts chapter 6, the very first dispute in the church, the very first fight in the church, if you would, or a dispute about making sure that one group of widows was being cared for in the daily ministration, the daily ministries of the church. Even as you carry through Paul's epistles, acts of generosity are mentioned multiple times. Acts of giving. He speaks in Timothy, giving instructions how widows are to be cared for. He speaks in, in 2 Corinthians on, 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 uh, as he was gathering a collection for the persecuted saints in Jerusalem. It was a very high emphasis in the church and should be in the church today, this idea of giving of alms. As one author puts it in the, the uh, New Bible Dictionary, he says, Alms are equated with righteousness, not because they justify a man, but because they constitute an action which is right and for which our neighbor has a rightful claim on us in the eyes of God, who gives us means for this very end. 
We've taught Financial Peace University here at our church, and one of the hallmarks of Financial Peace is it's looking at how to handle God's money, God's ways, simple, common sense truths about handling money. One of the things that is taught in that course is generosity. We are not created, we're not called to be collection bins where we take in wealth and we hold it to ourselves and we hold what God's blessed us with and we, 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 we sit like Ebenezer Scrooge in the cold back room. No, we are called to be conduits. We are called to be a pipeline through which God's blessing comes to us and through us to help those around us. Quite frankly put, we are to be generous people because we've been given so much. We are to be generous people because we have been given so much. There's a passage of scripture that God brought to my attention this morning as I was reviewing uh, the message. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to I just bring us to this here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 5 and then uh, skip down to verse 9. It says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth. Corinth was a wealthy town. It was a port city. Uh, it was a booming place. But he speaks of the churches of Macedonia. They are not so much. Notice verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction... The abundance of their joy and their deep, what's the word, church? Poverty. Poverty. Abounded unto the, what's that word? Of their liberality. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? <laughs> These people in great poverty abounded into the riches. <laughs> but it's the riches of their liberality. What is liberality? It's generosity. We're giving liberally. You know, how many like you get a, you know, a, a, a rack of ribs and you like to throw barbecue sauce on liberally, all right? That's the idea of what he's saying. With great abundance. I'm speaking our language. We, we, we're, we're communicating. We're illustrating here. This is my parables, I guess, what it is. Jesus desires for his people to be generous people. These these. these poor, poverty-stricken churches of Macedonia, they gave, they abounded is the word he uses, under the riches of their liberality, the richness of their generosity. For to their power I bear record, verse 3, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Notice verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through the, his poverty might be rich. Here, this, these churches of Macedonia, they, they know of a need. The, the ministering to the poor church saints, the poor persecuted Christians, and they want to be involved. That's what Paul is saying here. They, they were much in treaty. They pleaded with Paul. I can imagine the conversation here. Paul standing before this church, and this church is gathered up beyond what should have been their means to gather. They gave beyond what should have been their means to give. I can, I can see Paul, because I know his heart from other epistles, not willing to burden the church and say, no, no, guys, this is too much. You have your own needs. You have your own church to take care of. You have your own uh, things that you need to be doing. But they pleaded with him, they in, with, with much entry, please, Paul, we want to be involved. We want to help. We want to be a part of this. And Paul is reminding this wealthy church in Corinth, saying, hey, here's what your brethren are doing in Macedonia. They are reflecting the very nature of Jesus Christ, for he was rich. He is God, after all. He left heaven's glory for the 
humility, the abstract, the, 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 the lack of luster of being born in a stable in Bethlehem. Only witnesses to the birth were shepherds, the kind of outcasts. The, you know, the, in those days, the shepherds were, well, you can't really do anything else, so you can't be a lawyer or, or, or an engineer, so might as well just stick you out with the stinky sheep. That's what, was, that's what was taking place when Jesus was born on this earth. He was leaving everything, giving it all up for you and I. That's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus left heaven's glory to walk for 33 years on this sin-cursed earth, to seek and to save that which was lost, to serve as an example for us to follow after in his steps, that we would be born again not by our might, not by our power, but by the will of God. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again to offer us eternal life and to call us to follow him. Amen. And for that reason, we should be a generous people. We should be a giving people. But back in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus not only talks about how important it is to give, that's basically a given, pun not intended. But he emphasizes there's an importance on how we give. Notice verse number two. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be, have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, I'm not fully aware of the custom of the day. Just we have Jesus' word about it, uh, Jesus' testimony of what was taking place. It would seem that there would be those, probably the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were, they were typically the, the culprit in this case, that when they would give, they would, they would sound the trumpet. They would make a big show of their giving. They want everybody to know. And we see this similarly repeated uh, before Jesus' very eyes in the story of the widow's might. How many remember that story? Jesus is in Jerusalem. He and his disciples are in the temple. He actually just got done ripping on the Pharisees, the hypocrites, for taking advantage and devouring widows' houses. Then as they're in the temple, they see these, these wealthy people coming in, great bags of money. You know, I can picture like, you know, the Monopoly dude. You know, he's got that bag of money, you know, um, cash flying everywhere, but gold coins. They're throwing it in the pile. Everybody sees what this wealthy, wealthy Jewish man has given, this wealthy probably priest or, or, uh, or lawyer or, or, or Pharisee. But behind this Pharisee comes a widow an old lady. And she throws in two mites. The closest equivalent in our day and age is two pennies. Two cents. I mean, here's somebody, they get, probably just gave thousands of dollars worth of coins. Everybody saw it. Donated a new building right there. One little widow comes in with two cents. Without, without trying to get attention, drops it in, in the bucket and walks away. And Jesus takes note of that with the disciples and says, notice this woman, she has given more than they all. See, they gave her their abundance. She gave all that she had. And I don't believe in context this is teaching, you know, we need to go with all the widow ladies in the world and say, give everything you have, live with nothing, you know, Go star, because that, that, that's exactly what Jesus was just, you know, correcting. Was, what Jesus was just saying was not right, devouring widows' houses. But his emphasis here is they're giving for the sake to be seen of men. And he says, I, I want you, he, he gives an illustration, because we, we know it's an illustration, because it's not necessarily a possibility. He says, when you give, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. 
Now, it doesn't mean, you know, we're going to drop down from the ceiling like covert ops in the middle of the night to drop money in the you know, offering box. Please don't do that. <laughs> but the idea is, hey, I, I'm not drawing attention to myself. I'm giving out the heart because I love God. I don't care who sees or who doesn't. I'm doing it for an audience of one. Amen. Notice the next thing here he talks about. He speaks of prayer. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Now before we go into the how part, let us also pause as we did with, with giving and define it a little bit. Prayer is important in the Christian life. I could say, maybe take a, uh, use a stronger word. Prayer is imperial in the Christian life. Essential. You cannot live without it. Jesus wants us, he teaches us to pray to our Father. We ought to be in prayer each day. We ought to find time where we're spending with God each and every day in prayer. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Prayer is necessary. What, what I, I, I've heard, I don't know who originated this, but I've, I've seen it float around on, on social media. Great statement, though. Prayer is wartime communication. We live in this sin-cursed world. We walk amongst broken people. We walk in the midst of uh, a, a day and age where right is called wrong and evil is called good, and, and, and we are called to bear a gospel that is not popular Brother Austin gave the testimony of the Apple family there in China. It's not popular. They're not allowed to tell it. If, if, if the government finds out they're sharing that, they're, they're going to get kicked out of the nation, the country, or worse. A spiritual war against Satan and his forces who would love to see people destroyed. We battle the world. We battle the, the devil. We battle our own flesh. And that's the enemy I have to worry the most about. My own sinful desires that want to drag me back into the actions of my pre-salvation life. I'm not called to live according to my flesh and whatever lusts of my flesh are. I'm called to walk in the Spirit. That cannot be done outside of prayer. Can't. Impossibility. It's an essential element of the Christian life. But Jesus emphasizes again how it is important not to be praying simply to be seen of men. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. And verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Interesting, they're not praying to be heard of God. They're praying for men to see them. And to that, Jesus says, they got what they wanted. They have their reward. He begins to teach us how we ought to pray. We are to pray to him who sees in secret, again, to an audience of one. Notice verse 6, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut the door, Pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. It's a good thing to have a, a, a quiet place where you can get alone in prayer. A secret place. Maybe not so much a closet as Jesus is illustrating there. He's not saying you can only ever pray in a closet. <laughs> That's not what he's saying there. It's not a bad place. But where is it that you resort for prayer? Where do you go when you need to be alone? Where, where do you walk with the Lord when, when nobody else is there to interrupt? Pray to him that sees in secret. That's who we're talking to, by the way. As we gather as a church, we pray corporately. The Bible instructs us that we are to do that. So it's not wrong to pray corporately. But when we do pray, Brother Rick, you aren't to be praying to, for the people to hear you. You're praying to one audience. When I pray for the sermon, I'm going to be praying for God to hear. We're going to be praying together as a church corporately for the Lord to hear us. We pray to Him who sees in secret. Let me say this, letter B, under prayer, we are to pray intelligently. We are to pray intelligently. 
Now, I've used that word before, uh, and let me define that. It means we ought to know what we're actually talking about. We're not just coming to God just for the sake of rambling. You know, uh, our prayer time with God ought not be of the same content value as a college freshman's uh, first you know, semester paper, okay? All fluff, no substance. No, when we pray to God, we ought to pray intelligently. It even gives us some instruction. We have here, we, we often call it the Lord's Prayer. That's not quite an accurate title for that section of Scripture. Because he says, after this manner, pray ye. It's not, he's not giving us a, a, a rote phrase to copy. He's giving us a pattern, an example to follow. After this manner, in this way. This is how I want you to pray. He begins, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In our prayer life, there ought to be an attitude uh, that, uh, that, that reminds us who we're talking to. We're talking to the heavenly Father. We're talking to our Father, by whom Paul says in Romans, we can come to him and say, Abba, which is a term of endearment, Father, Daddy, This is only possible for his children, by the way. In John chapter 1, it says, to them, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There's those that go around and say, Well, we're all God's children. Biblically, that's inaccurate. Before I was saved, the Bible says I was an enmity with God. I was an enemy of the kingdom of God. I was a criminal guilty of treason, high treason against the king of heaven. But when Jesus saved me, I went from being a criminal, an outcast, bound for a Christless eternity in a place called hell to being one of his own children, adopted into his family, a child of the king of kings, I'm an heir with Christ, the Bible tells me. All these things are made possible only through receiving the gift of eternal life that Jesus offers. And because we've received that gift and we pray, oftentimes we say, in thy name, amen, or you know, in, in the name of Jesus, amen. It's a reminder to us that we have this privilege only through the name of Jesus. As we approach boldly the throne of, Christ, of grace, we also reminded there is a certain amount of reverence due to our God. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. It reminds us of our hope and desire for him to rule in all the hearts of men. We as Christians, we have a hope. We have a great expectation that Jesus is going to come again. That all these things that we see in this world, all the suffering, the sorrow, the death, the disease, all of it's going to come to an end because one day he is coming again. We have that hope. We have that expectation. It's much like some of your kids do this time of year. They have a hope. They have a wish list. But it goes beyond that, you know, I hope I get a, you know, whatever. But it's like, you know, your kids come in the garage, they, they've asked for a new bike. And they see in the back of the garage this bike-like shape covered in a sheet. And you ask, you know, little, little Bobby, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, I'm hoping to get a bicycle. That's the kind of hope we Christians have. It is a sure hope. It is an earnest expectation because what we've been given is the very promise of God himself. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also, thy kingdom come. Reminds us of our hope, our desire. We pray intelligent, intelligently looking for that coming day. As we hope for that kingdom to come, we pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, 
Going back to that previous statement that we're, we're expecting him to come. But until that day, Lord, help me to live according to your will. Help me to do that which you've called me to do. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, we're to pray for our physical needs. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing selfish. God wants us to ask about those things. After all, he is our heavenly father. You fathers, you know you want your kids to come to you. You want them to ask. We're trying to teach Judson right now uh, to, to, to ask for things. He, he, he's gotten in very much into trains. And we have these wooden trains that, that were mine at, at his age. And, you know, just kind of, I would, I would like to say lovingly held on to through the years. But they went through the uh, youngest of my family. And that was, he, he earned the nickname Thrasher for a reason. So they're not quite as lovingly held on to. But we have them. And there's one piece of the train track that's just too big to be down on his level. Uh, so we put it up on a shelf. And this morning, he, he wanted that train track. And I'm in our room getting ready. And he's here, eh, eh. And I know what he's wanting. So I'm coming in there. And I'm trying to teach him, say, help, please. I want him to come to me with his desire. I want him to come to me with his need and say, help, please, Daddy. Help, please. God wants you to do the same. He wants you to say, help, please. Father, help. I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. Help. I don't know how I'm going to make this, uh, take care of this, this medical need. Help. God, please intervene. He wants us to pray for that. It's amazing how often he answers that before we even ask him. And forgive us our debts. That's our sins as we forgive our debtors, those who have wronged us. And Jesus does emphasize here we are to forgive those. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We ought to be praying for God's protection. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reminder again. See, he's not just giving us something we, we throw out without thinking about. We ought to be thinking about what we're going to pray for. Pray intelligently. Pray to him that sees in secret. Let me say this, letter C under prayer. We are to pray humbly. Pray humbly. Again, this is the opposite of what those hypocrites were doing in the synagogues. Standing to be seen of men. I think of Jesus' parable that he tells about the publican and the Pharisee. Two men entered into the temple to pray. One a publican, one a Pharisee. As the Pharisee began to pray, he stood, lifting his eyes toward heaven and said, Oh, Lord God, I thank you that I am not as other men. I tithe uh, of mint and anise. I, 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 I fast, and we'll talk about that in a moment, two times a week. I'm thankful that I'm not as this publican. Here's the publican, the tax collector, the con man for Rome. He couldn't even look up into heaven. Facing down into the earth upon his knees, he pounds upon his own chest and says, Oh Lord, I'm a sinful man. Will you forgive me? And Jesus says of the parable there, Which one do you think God heard? We're to pray humbly. Notice what he says there in verse 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What an ultimate act of pride. We who are forgiven of so much, unwilling to forgive another. And God says, you won't forgive. I won't forgive. Our lack of forgiveness, in fact, is a sin. It's bitterness we hold on to. It's arrogance before the high court of heaven to, to, to be unwilling to forgive. He speaks of prayer. We're to pray before him who sees in secret. We're to pray intelligently. We're to pray humbly. Not as the hypocrite to be seen of men. They have the reward. We give not uh, so our right hand doesn't know what our left hand's doing. Not as the hypocrite to be seen of men for they have the reward. He has another area he addresses here, the area of fasting. Fasting is simply to go without. Typically you find examples of the scripture people are going without food or sometimes without water. 
It is a practice. It is a spiritual discipline that is almost unheard of in the church today, and it should be something we do practice more often. I know there are things that have to be considered. You know, if you have diabetes and things like that, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, go without eating for three days. That, that's not good, okay? Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, well, Pastor Dunn said, no, don't do that. But at times in our lives, it is a, it is a healthy spiritual activity to say, I'm going to pull it away. I'm going to fast from something. Maybe it's a fast from food, or maybe it's a fast uh, from some type of pleasure. Maybe it's a fast from social media, whatever the case may be. It's a good thing to do that from time to time. But notice what Jesus says here of, these, of, uh, uh, of those that were fasting. He says, moreover, when ye fast. He expects us to do it, by the way. When ye fast, not if ye fast, but when ye fast. Be not as the hypocrites. What do they do? They have a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. These guys that get up with the clown frowny faces, you know. So we picture, I picture in my mind you know, the, the frowny face clown that you see at the circus. That's what I see with these Pharisees. But they, they, they go out, and oftentimes they would fast. And some of the strict uh, uh, um, stricter sects of the Pharisees, they'd fast twice a week. That was the expectation. But when they fasted, man, you could tell. You, could know, you knew it was happening. They were, they, were, they were sad. They were cast down. They were bummed out. Everything was terrible because they wanted people to know, oh, he's fasting. Oh, he's spiritual. Do not, do not touch him lest we condemn him uh, with, with our own uh, unrighteousness. That's what they were doing. And Jesus said they have the reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. Go take a shower <laughs> before, you, before you fast. Don't, 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 don't put on this facade. Don't, he says that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, he's drawing the attention. We're not to be hypocrites. We're not to do what we do, spiritual things to be seen of men, but we as Christians are to do what we do for an audience of one. Let's come to the application time now. Decision time. Do you notice the actions are the same? Both are fasting. Both are giving alms. Both are praying. One looks distinctly more spiritual. But the difference is the heart motive behind the actions. One is real. One is sincere before God. While the other is only concerned putting on a show before men. Church, don't be a hypocrite. Before we close, there's another pitfall I want to acknowledge here. Some see the hypocrisy of others and conclude that the only right way to be real is not do any religious actions at all. These say, because others give with wrong motives, then I will not give. Because others pray with wrong motives, then I will not pray. Because others fast with wrong motives, then I will not fast. There's no point in it anyway. To this I say, no, no, no. The solution to spiritual hypocrisy is not spiritual apathy. Let me say that again. The solution to spiritual hypocrisy is not spiritual apathy. The do-nothing attitude doesn't solve it, doesn't fix it. In fact, James says in the book of James that if our faith comes without works, in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, our faith is dead. He says, you have faith and I have works. Uh, he says, let me show you my faith by my works. We show our faith in Christ by giving alms. Not it has to be seen of men, but we, we, we know God's called us to do it. We believe his word, so we're going to do it. 
We, know by, we, we believe by faith that prayer works. And if we believe by faith that prayer works, then we're going to pray. We believe by faith that fasting is a spiritual uh, uh, di discipline. And, and if we believe that fasting is a spiritual discipline, we're going to fast. Our faith is played out in action. Uh, we, we use the word religion, and religion seems to be a dirty word these days. And in many cases, for, for many reasons, it is. Dead religion, hypocrite religion, abusive religion. You know, Jesus is against all of those. He spent three years riling up the religious leaders that were promoting that. Of course, that's who we are to look to. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, I'll read this passage and be done. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience, this endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We who are followers of Jesus have been called to live a life that is real before him. We're called to step out in faith and do as he has led us to do. We're called to give. We're going to do that this evening with, with the, the uh, Thanksgiving outreach. We're called to pray. We've done that three times already this service. We're going to probably do it a fourth time before we're done. We're called to fast. I don't know if anybody's doing that here. I'm not. I had bacon and eggs this morning, praise the Lord. And I'm all messed you all up because all my illustrations are food illustrations because that seems to be what gets through our people's minds. We're to do all those things. But we're to do so focusing on the audience of one. Looking unto Jesus. It doesn't say looking unto the pastor. The church is given pastors, though the example ought to be follow me as I also follow Christ. It doesn't say looking unto the pastor. This pastor will fail you. I can 100% guarantee it. I somehow, some way, usually unintentionally, will fail you. Stay around long enough, okay? He says, Pastor, you're perfect. Stay around long enough. It won't last. I promise. The members of this church, listen to me, will fail you. I can guarantee it, 100%. Jesus said it is impossible, but that offenses should come. It will happen. Somebody is going to upset you. But you know who never fails? The one we're to be looking to. You know whose example is always perfect? You know who is never a hypocrite ever, ever, ever? And will never be and has never been? Jesus. So I challenge us here, application here. Look to Jesus. Let's be real. Let's not be hypocrites. But the only way that will be accomplished is if you look to Christ. Now, some of you are here this morning, you've never been born again. That's where it starts. That's the beginning. That's, that's the foundational. Nothing happens in the Christian life until the Christian life begins. But some of you, you've been saved for a long time. And if you're like me, you've had hurts. People failed you. If you're like me, you've been in the depression. If you're like me, you've stumbled and fallen and got up wondering, why am I even doing this thing? Is that too, too, is that too open there? If you're like me, you'll fail. But Jesus never fails. Let's stand together.